They sold furs and slaves down the great rivers of Eastern Europe to Constantinople and Baghdad. They brought back silk, spices and silver, which they hoarded in treasure troves in their homeland. They captured the world's largest city and founded the first Russian states. They were the Varangians, the Rus, the Vikings. Istanbul, Turkey, once Constantinople, the greatest city of the ancient world, heart of a thousand-year-old empire. To the Vikings, and still today, it is the gateway to the east. First, the Scandinavian warriors came here to plunder. Then, in a daring raid, they penetrated its massive defenses and extracted a privileged trade deal. Today it is believed, as far as I know, that the appearance of the Vikings here in Eastern Europe in the 9th century is closely connected with their desire for silver. Obviously, the Eastern world was most interested in slaves and furs. The Vikings had plundered the vast plains of Central Europe for centuries before they pushed up the river systems to the Black Sea and attacked Constantinople. Dozens of rune stones, like these in modern-day Sweden, tell us of the fearless Scandinavian warriors who died in faraway Greece and Turkey. Rune stones, sagas, and the first Russian chronicle tell us the story of the Vikings of Eastern Europe. But before anything was written, Vikings were plundering the shoreline of the Baltic Sea. Two amazing Viking ships, found on the Estonian island of Sarema and excavated in 2011, prove that the Vikings were here far earlier than ever recorded. When Yuri Peets of the history faculty of Tallinn sent bones and organic artifacts for radiocarbon dating, the results were stunning. Analysis of the items we found show that they can be dated to pre-Viking times. The warriors who died here were a class of professional fighters, or Vikings, as they are known today. At first we weren't quite sure where these men came from. Judging from some of the items and other marks, it was more or less clear we were dealing with Scandinavian sailors. Two sites in Poland also prove that the Vikings colonized the estuaries of the great rivers of Central Europe to control access to the plains of modern-day Russia, Poland and Ukraine, rich in furs and slaves. Marek Jagodzinski has excavated the site of Truso near Elplong for the past 20 years. The finds here show a vibrant industrial town dominated by a Viking military elite, a base for the trafficking of people and goods all the way to the Black Sea. First of all, what we found was that the size of the settlement was about 20 hectares with regular buildings. The division of the harbour area from the centre area and evidence of crafts and trade activity around the harbour. On the western edge of today's Poland, near the estuary of the Oder River, lies Volin, another Viking trading post, where local Baltic populations mixed with the Viking traders. Wojciech Filipowiak heads the excavations here. Written sources tell us that people of many ethnic origins settled here in Volin. 
We know about Saxons, but we can't find any archaeological traces of them, and the Rus also. And we know that Arabs came here because of the amber and other objects of trade. Innych, innych towarów również i Arabowie. Natomiast... Every year, hundreds of modern-day Vikings come here to participate in mock battles and live the life of the Scandinavian raiders. The Oda was one of their entry points to the great Central European plains. The rivers that flow into the Baltic Sea were the thoroughfares for trade with the south. Far to the east lay the most profitable route of them all. Lake Ladoga, Europe's largest lake and Russia's northernmost expanse of fresh water. One of its tributaries is the great river Volkov, the waterway leading to the industrial complexes of Volkov city and Kirishi. For thousands of years, this lake and river system was the gateway to the depths of the Russian steppe and beyond it to the civilizations of the Eastern Mediterranean. For the Vikings, it was just one of the entry points in their aggressive penetration of the Eastern European landmass. A few kilometers south of the Volkhov estuary into Lake Ladoga lies Staria Ladoga. Here, Archaeological excavations have exposed the birthplace of Russia. The typical runic inscriptions and Scandinavian amulets that date back to 753 show that the Vikings had come to dominate this strategic point on the river almost half a century before the first recorded raids against Western Europe. This is Staria Ladoga, where for certain we have found Scandinavian artifacts dating to before the Viking Age. This is the story of how the great eastern empire of the Vikings developed out of a small band of ruthless pagan traders and warriors drawn to the incredible riches of the eastern Mediterranean. It starts here, in Staria Ladoga, an ancient trading place on the Volkhov River in northern Russia. The most important artifacts relating to the Vikings go back to ancient times, mainly the 9th and 10th centuries. Their ships ploughed the seas and rivers of the north and penetrated into the landmass of today's Russia, Ukraine and Poland in search of the legendary wealth of the south. Here, they captured slaves, plundered furs, and took them to the cities of Baghdad and Constantinople, where they exchanged them for silver coins, some of which found their way back to the Viking homeland. Today, as far as I know, most researchers believe that the Scandinavians exported silver from the Caspian Sea and imported furs taken from Eastern Europe. But here there is some divergence in opinion on the origins of certain goods. Furs were objects of prestige, not very practical, but of prestige. The Vikings, or Varangians as they were known here, founded an enduring empire based on the immense wealth gained from trafficking precious goods and slaves with the great empires of Byzantium and Baghdad. Early in the 8th century AD, the Vikings conquered trading places along the rivers of Russia. A hundred kilometers south of Staria Ladoga, archaeology students from Moscow are washing mud from Viking Age graves at Rurikova Garadishche, on the banks of the Volkhov River, opposite the city of Novgorod. Russia's first capital. They find a blue bead, which once belonged to a Viking woman's necklace. The day before, they found an axe head, confirming that these tombs were the final resting place of the earliest Viking warriors who came to dominate the area. The finds from this site are sent to the museum's restoration laboratories. 
Here, a laboratory technician is cleaning and preserving wooden objects from the many sites around the city of Novgorod. The wood is preserved using glycol that replaces water in the wood cells. The excess is frozen dry. Alessia Rude is the curator of Novgorod's Viking exhibition and has been following the results of the Rurikova Garadishche excavations for years. According to the chronicles confirmed by archaeological finds, this village was founded by one of the Scandinavian princes, Rus as they were called, Prince Rorik. He came here in our lands with his Drujina or band of Varangians. The arrival of the Vikings or Varangians is dated to approximately 840 AD. The Finnish name for them was Ruotsi, corrupted to the word Rus, the name the new military elite came to be known by for centuries. Discover the past with exclusive medieval documentaries and ad-free podcasts presented by world-renowned historians from History Hit. Watch them on your smart TV or on the go with your mobile device. Download the app now to explore everything from our series on medieval pleasures to the notorious Knights Templar, the Princes in the Tower and the Battle of Hastings. Immerse yourself in the captivating stories of this remarkable era by signing up via the link in the description. There are no finds that directly refer to Rorik. However, we have found artifacts dating back to the early Middle Ages, the 9th century, that are connected to Scandinavian culture and were found at Rurikovo Garadishe. Today we link the word Rus with the Finnish word Ruotsi. There is no doubt about that. However, in ancient Rus tradition, it is possible that the word Rus referred initially not to a country or a people, but to a social group. The dynasty of Rurik ruled Russia for hundreds of years. Chapters of history told here on this monument in Novgorod. His son, Ingvar, or Igor, was a child when he died and Rurik's faithful companion, Oljek, reigned until he came of age. Polish professor Czeslaw Skrok has passionately studied the Viking kingdoms of Europe. And Ingvar was raised by Oleg, the leading noble. He had a catastrophe on his hands. Rurik had allowed friendly Scandinavians to sail down the Dnieper and set up a new settlement. Their leaders were Askold and Dir. The city of Kiev stands on a bend in the river Dnieper. Rurik's followers, Askold and Dir, captured the town and turned it into their base for a new push down the river system towards the Black Sea. In 860, the city of Constantinople witnessed the arrival of a flotilla of Viking ships. The emperor was away, fighting the Arabs, and the Vikings, although dissuaded from attacking the city by its massive walls, attacked the coastline instead. The city's religious leaders had taken refuge on the so-called Prince's Islands, which the Vikings mercilessly pillaged. For the first time, the Vikings contemplated the wealth of the imperial capital with their own eyes. They would come back for more. Oleg was angry that Askold and Dir had gained such power, that they wanted to be Jarls or even more. They had power because when they were in Kiev, they attacked Byzantium, the greatest power in the world at the time. They were so brave that they pillaged Constantinople. So it's historical fact that Oleg murdered Askold and Dir. Oleg captured Kiev and murdered Askold and Dir whose tombs lie under this church on the riverbank outside the city. Next, he moved on Constantinople, known to the Vikings as Mikkelgarde. In 907 AD, once again the Viking fleet appeared on the Bosphorus 
sacking coastal villages and Christian monasteries. In a famous surprise attack, Aliek had wheels put on his ships, carried them across land, crossed the Golden Horn, and entered the city. Unable to hold the prize of all prizes, Aliek the pagan settled for a privileged trade agreement and strategic alliance with the imperial city, the heart of the Christian world, which turned the kingdom of Kiev and Novgorod into the most powerful state in Eastern Europe, which also supplied mercenaries for the emperor's bodyguard. It was a lucrative business, as the Varangian guardsmen were paid 40 gold pieces a year, plus food, lodging, and special bonuses. The golden era of the Vikings in the east was about to begin. The sun rises on the Viking mounds of Staria Ladoga. This burial mound once held the remains of Rurik's successor, Aliek, whose attack on Constantinople is the high point of the Viking Eastern saga, thrusting these fearless barbarians into the history books of the great city. The primary source of our knowledge of the Viking origins of Russia is the chronicle written by a Christian Orthodox monk called Nestor, who is buried here in Kiev, in the Monastery of the Caves, the very first built on the river Dnieper. Nestor recounts the development of the first Russian state, but makes no mention of what happened to Askold and Deer's followers. According to Czislaw Skrok, they fled westwards to modern-day Poland. There was no military opposition here. The population was sedentary and calm. There was no one to stop them. To the north was the Baltic Sea, with access via Wolin, Kołobrzeg, Truso and Elblong. There were the swamps of Notek, so they had security. On the west, I mean protection from Kiev and Novgorod, there were swamps of the Poles and to the east the Slavs of the Elbe and Alder. However, when we talk of Scandinavians who settled in the land of future ancient Russia, I don't think we can talk of great global migration of peoples who moved freely between Normandy and York, for example, and Iceland and Kiev. The rise of Poland as a place of passage of the cosmopolitan Viking elites of the time is highlighted by the remarkable archaeological find at Borja, near the Vistula River. Andrzej Bugo excavated the site that turns Polish history on its head. This is a completely untraditional cemetery because there's nothing like this cemetery in the whole of Europe. Every grave is rich. There is no poor grave. It's a cemetery for the social elite. The archaeologists excavating Borja found a number of graves from different epochs and different cultures. The multi-ethnic community controlled a key point on the river Vistula. Let's take Bodja. There we have traders. We find equipment that shows that these people engaged in trade. There were also warriors with their families, people who control this thoroughfare. The thoroughfare of the Vistula is very important because it connects the North Sea, Baltic Sea, via the Vistula, via the River Buk, to the Black Sea and Byzantium. So controlling this route was the best way to become rich. The central figure was a young male warrior killed in battle, his jaw hacked off. He was buried with two women, possibly slaves, and with his weapons and armor. Professor Bucho called in experts in strontium isotopes and DNA to identify where the skeletons came from. The northern and central Vistula are very important. We have found many graves or cemeteries along this river 
that have produced Scandinavian artifacts. In most of them, we have only these artifacts to prove the connection, while in Bodja, we also did strontium isotope and DNA analysis, proving that these were indeed foreigners. The coins from Germany and England found in the graves are key in dating the cemetery to the late 10th and early 11th century, the period of the rise of the very first Polish kingdom, founded by King Mieszka of the Piast dynasty. In Poland, the Viking remains seem to indicate that Scandinavians had more influence on local politics than was thought before. In my opinion, Vikings, I mean Vikings from Kiev, Rus Kiev, the ones who built Viking Russia, came down the Vistula and Buk to Mazovje and Wielkopolska, where Poland began. We owe them the origins of the Polish nation. I don't mean they built it, but they sparked it off. Their impact was key. They brought the know-how and sowed the seed of our country in these territories. In the 10th century, the tribe of the Poles, which inhabited central Poland, began expanding at the expense of other Slavic groups. The dynasty of the Piast, say Polish sources, began with a simple trader. But the first king, Mieszka, a pagan, united all the Slavs of central Poland under his rule. However, his daughter married the Danish Viking king Sven Forkbeard and his granddaughter Sviatopolk, son of Voldemar or Vladimir of Kiev. Understanding this coincidence is at the heart of the debate about Viking influence in the founding of Poland. We find more and more sites, for example, Bodja. For me, Swatopelk was buried in Bodja, Russian Swatopelk, who was married with the daughter of Bolesław Chobry. I'm sure that the objects which were found there and the way the grave was organized show that it was a Scandinavian Norman burial with a little influence of the West. We gain more information by analysis of other finds. He had a warrior's belt, and at the end of it was the so-called bident, with a cross. The bident is the sign of Rurik's line, and the cross means that there was some connection with Zvetopełek, called the Accursed, who was the son-in-law of our king, Bolesław Chobry. Świętopełka, zwanego Przeklętym, który był zięciem naszego króla Bolesława Chrobrego. The movement of peoples up and down the rivers of Central and Eastern Europe proves that the Vikings were not constantly at war with their neighbors and may even have provided just the military element of this multicultural society. We made several interesting discoveries which show that people from these territories had contacts with steppe peoples, mainly the Khazars. In the second and third rows we find burial chambers with characteristic niches. They are not regular as in the first row, but they have this kind of niche. These graves with niches are characteristic of the steppe people. Very often we find this kind of grave in Khazar culture. Key artifacts of the excavation at Truso are exhibited in the small museum in Elplonk. The scales are particularly significant, as the Vikings valued their goods in weights of hack silver, coins, jewels, or other objects that could be re-smelted into ingots. Combs were a favorite Scandinavian ornament, and women wore necklaces made from glass beads imported from Constantinople. Other artifacts that confirm the prevalent Scandinavian culture in Truso were the amulets, especially this Valkyrie, a protector of Viking warriors. 
Amber was in the third place of the most desired things, just after slaves and swords. So amber was very popular in that time. Amber was exported in trade networks which Vikings created in the Baltic Sea. Amber was abundant along these shores, and there was a strong market in the south for this precious resin. It was worked and made into jewellery here. However, there was an even richer item to trade. The river systems of Russia and Poland sliced through land inhabited by Slavic peoples. The Rus of Kiev, Vikings, plundered the land for slaves and sold them to the great empires of the south and west. These were the single most profitable trade and one witnessed by many a chronicler. A written source from Ibrahim ibn Yaqub. He was a Spanish traveler from Seville. He mentioned that Varangians, Normans, came to Prague with slaves. Where were they from? From Kiev and Krakow. It is even said that in the 10th century, Arab slave markets were full of slaves from Eastern Europe. Several million dirhams were exported from the Caspian Sea towards Europe. Slaves, furs, amber and walrus ivory flowed into the markets of the Mediterranean and Central Europe down the rivers of Russia and Poland. The kings in Kiev had almost exclusive access to the richest cities in the world. The Kiev Vikings, known here as Rus, raided and traded down this river, whose dangerous rapids earned a fearsome reputation. They were navigable only with the high water. In the summer months, cargo had to be carried around them making traders vulnerable to attack from fierce nomadic tribes, such as the Khazars, Bulgars and Pechniks. As far as I know, today we do not believe there was a great difference between merchants and warriors in Scandinavian culture. We can only say that in the 10th century, when there was almost no centralized power in most of the land, it was impossible not to be a warrior. Often in the Scandinavian graves, we find, for example, not only weapons, but also scales and some silver to allow this person to be a trader. So it's hard to say whether they should be defined as simply Scandinavians or Vikings. In the space of 20 years, the Viking warriors and traders had penetrated deep into the Russian plains and forests, building camps and trading posts along the rivers, and reached the Black Sea. After they struck a trade deal with Constantinople, they gathered yearly convoys of ships here at Kherson, still a thriving Black Sea port, and sailed to the great city. None of this would have been possible without the Viking ships, such as the ones uncovered on Sarema Island. They were light, shallow keeled and fast. Good for attack and for trade. Jan Biel is the curator of the Viking Ship Museum in Oslo and the foremost expert on Viking ships. The Viking ships gave the Scandinavians a mobility that was unique at the time. The fact that the ships were built so light, that they were so fast and so seaworthy, made it possible to conduct a type of warfare that was very difficult for the European kingdoms to handle. Modern replicas suggest Viking ships could reach top speeds of 20 to 25 knots, though on longer trips it is expected they moved more slowly, at about the 3 to 6 knot range. The Vikings built many kinds of ship, both for war and for transport.
Having said that, there are also many myths about the Viking ships and their use, and one of the hardest myths to defeat is that the Vikings traveled with their ships up the Russian rivers all the way down to the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. We have no evidence that this happened. On the other hand, we do have historical and archaeological evidence that they used to change their means of transport on the way into something suitable for the area and landscape that they were traveling through. The great trade expeditions from Kiev to Kherson and beyond involved a complex network of bases. With high water, the ships could withstand the rapids, while with low water, the traders carried their goods on horses and reloaded boats downstream for their onward transport to Kherson, where seagoing ships would await them for the journey to Constantinople. Once they arrived at the water systems leading down to the Black Sea or the Caspian Sea, then they would start sailing again. And we have a fantastic Byzantine source that describes how the Scandinavians did this. Aljek's successor, Igor, or Ingvar, Rurik's son, led unsuccessful attacks against Byzantium and the Arab Empire and was killed on a punitive raid. His son, Sviatislav, made an alliance with Constantinople and succeeded in destroying the Khazar Empire. He too was killed during a trade expedition by Pechneg nomads during a land portage around the Dnieper Rapids. All the gains that Rurik's descendants had made over the century were squandered in a devastating civil war that brought about a radical change in the nature of the Viking Russian state. This did not stop them trading up and down the rivers of Russia, however, where the Arab diplomat Ibn al-Fatlan found them on the Volga River. He described the bizarre pagan funeral rites of Viking warriors, which included the sacrifice of slave girls. The men he described were still very barbaric, according to Arab standards. They were tattooed from head to toe and rarely took baths. The civil war between Rurik's offspring left Valdemar or Vladimir as sole ruler. He expanded the kingdom of Novgorod and Kiev into Poland and eastwards and boldly demanded the hand of Princess Anna, sister of the Emperor of Constantinople, in exchange for his military support in quelling a rebellion. Vladimir chose to become an Orthodox Christian after famously considering all the monotheistic religions of the time and seems to have embraced Slavs in his court. Vladimir's illegitimate son, Zviatopolk, married into the Polish royal dynasty when he was exiled from Kiev on the succession of Yaroslav the Wise, maybe the greatest Viking king of Russia. The fates of the royal dynasties of Denmark, Norway and Sweden passed through the plains of Russia and Poland. Slowly, over time, although the first Christian Viking king of Russia, Vladimir and his successors, continued to draw on Scandinavia for military manpower, the cities became more multicultural. However, we don't see permanent conflict in the 9th and 10th century. It is probable that the local population was Slavic in certain areas and Finnish in others, and the Scandinavians occupied certain niches. There is no indication that the traffic and trade of silver and furs occurred outside Scandinavian culture. Later, the Vikings and the Scandinavians were assimilated into the local population. So as time goes by, their influence becomes imperceptible. They become the local population as much as the Slavs. They get married and have children, and are no longer distinguished from the local population. 
This also involves the ruling class at Rurikovo Garadishe, where we find artifacts dating to as late as the 15th century. However, Scandinavian remains go back to the 11th century at the latest. The goods bought in these and other territories found their way to the great Scandinavian market towns of Kaupang near Oslo in Norway, Hedeby in Denmark and Birka in Sweden. Here in Kaupang, the archaeological remains show a flourishing trade between the farthest northern seas and the two capitals of the Mediterranean world, Baghdad and Constantinople. In 2004, the shores of what was once Constantinople revealed a whole port with sunken ships of the time the Vikings were trading there. The goods brought back from the Greek world were not only silver, but also silk, fine beads and jewels. The flat-bottomed Viking ships would have been docked alongside these typical Mediterranean craft, as traders mingled in the markets of the empire's capital before the Scandinavians undertook the long and perilous journey northwards. As the market towns grew, so did the wealth of the chieftains who controlled them. They enhanced profit through trade by the exertion of military might, striking local alliances, where necessary even through marriage, to ensure the flow of goods to their own markets. In some cases, we know that objects which were not typical of Slavic culture were produced here. So we know that glass beads or some kind of decoration on the monuments were probably 100% produced in this place. Volin is believed to have been the base of the so-called Jomsborg Vikings and was one of the richest towns in the Scandinavian sphere of interest although firmly in the Slavonic ethnic area. We must think about this as a whole. The written sources say that Jomsborg was a huge city on the South Baltic coastline. And they tell us about events in this place at that time. So when we discover archaeologically this kind of big city dating back to medieval times, and we find lots of artifacts for trade and export and crafts and so forth, we have no doubts that this is that place. This rune stone that stands on Oland commemorates the greatest battle of the Joms Vikings, when their commander attempted to win the throne of Sweden on the plain of Uppsala. It invokes Odin and his daughter, a rare mention of pagan gods on a rune stone. According to the ancient sagas, written down centuries after the events by Icelandic scribes, the Joms Vikings were mercenaries who often fought as allies of the Danish king Harald Bluetooth. Some may well have also been of Slavic origin. Fighting for a king for plunder and for money was an honorable activity, and for hundreds of Viking men fortunes were to be made and lost in the plains of Poland and Russia. Their political influence on Slavic tribes, however, is the subject of heated debate. We have two periods in which Scandinavians come to Polish territories. In the late 9th century and early 10th, they were settlers, people who live in houses as part of a local community. And here we find equipment which is typical for people who do not take part in wars. They haven't got swords. But if we talk about the second part of the 10th century and beginning of the 11th, when the Vikings moved and developed as a group, we do find swords in graves. Although Moravian influences in building the Polish state were also strong, King Mieszka I of Poland married his daughter to the Danish king Sven Forkbeard to ensure that the Scandinavians continued to exert their power in this area, possibly to counter the spread of the Germanic Empire eastwards. Through his marriage to the Polish princess, 
Zwien Forkbeard's empire stretched from Poland to the British Isles, and the taxes he could raise from trade along the whole Baltic coastline turned him into the most powerful Viking king. However, he was not the only Viking monarch whose fortune was tied to the east. Olaf Tryggvason worked as a mercenary for Vladimir before leaving Russia for the north, where he eventually married an Irish queen and became the first Christian king of Norway, and died fighting his Danish rival in the year 1000. But the greatest Viking of them all was the commander of the Imperial Varangian Guard, Harald Hadrada. He made a fortune as a mercenary, but never forgot his descent from the Norwegian royal line. As commander of the Varangian Guard, Harald Hadrada played a key role in the politics of the great empire and learned how to rule as a Christian king from the most powerful emperors of the time. In 1040, he left the heady imperial court for the north and traveled the rivers of Russia back to his homeland in Norway, conquering the throne there before attacking England. It was the year 1066, and the sun was setting on the Viking era. The valiant Viking won the first battle against the Saxon king here at Fulford, near York but died a heroic death in the Battle of Stamford Bridge, now a quiet Yorkshire village, famous only for the last victory of the Anglo-Saxons. During the Scandinavian transition to the Middle Ages, at the end of the Viking Age, we also see that the ship becomes a measure for various things. There are examples of tax systems based on land being divided into ships' crews. It sort of becomes a metaphor for society. Harald left behind him hundreds of Scandinavian Varangians, who still spoke and wrote in the Nordic language. The palace at Constantinople overlooked the straits between Europe and Asia and so occupied perhaps the most strategic place in the ancient world. Close by, the great church of Justinian, the Hagia Sophia, was the largest church in the Christian world. Inside, in one of the top galleries, a Varangian guardsman left his mark in runic writing. His name, Halfdan, is clearly visible. But the Hagia Sophia is not the only popular tourist spot today where one can find runic inscriptions where they are least expected. Here at the Arsenale in Venice stand two famous lion statues which once guarded the harbor in Piraeus, the port of Athens. The carvings tell of Horsi, a good warrior, cut down in battle after winning much gold. This runestone is in the churchyard in Tumbo, Sweden. It commemorates a Scandinavian warrior who died in the service of the emperor. The Greece runestones are the most common among these commemorative monuments in Sweden. Ingmar the Far-Travelled was the most famous freebooting Viking of the East. He served at the court of Yaroslav and then as a mercenary for the Byzantine Empire winning a famous battle at Sassireti in Georgia that the Vikings called Sirkland, the land of the Saracens. Only one of the many ships that sailed with him from Sweden returned, and 26 runestones commemorate men who died in the expedition. Tola had this stone raised in memory of her son Harald, Ingvar's brother. They traveled valiantly far for gold and in the east gave food to the eagle and died in the south in Sirkland. Harald was Ingvar's brother and left from Sweden to make his fortune. He found his death instead. At the end of the 11th century, the Scandinavian states became Christian. Trade became more peaceful. 
the empty space of Europe filled up with new states and opportunities for pillage all but disappeared. The last great tragic massacre of the Varangian Guard at Manzikert by the Turks marked the beginning of the end of the Byzantine Empire. The ethnic origins of the first kings of Poland and Russia remain a mystery if we consider that the very description of a Viking is still shrouded in uncertainty. Scandinavian warriors colonized, plundered, traded and had families throughout the central and eastern plains of Europe. Their DNA eventually mingled with the local populations and they adopted the local languages. But their contribution to building these new states is recorded forever in the chronicles or carved on stone. And it lurks at the very roots of Russian and Polish history.